So excited to be at GopherCon again. I'm Katie Hockman. I am an engineering manager over at Datadog in their application performance monitoring, tracing, organization. And I'm here today to talk about fuzzing, which is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, before this, uh, I was on the Go team. I worked on, as I said, security and cryptography. I worked on the module mirror and checksum database, which I talked about back here in 2019. And then I worked on fuzzing. I uh, drafted the design draft and proposal and led the engineering efforts. And I'm absolutely thrilled to get the opportunity to chat with you about it today. So the first thing you might be wondering when you look at this talk title is what does it mean for something to be fuzzy? I wondered the same thing. I said, where does that word come from? So I Googled fuzzy, obviously, looked at the definitions. First definition, something that has a frizzy, fluffy, or frayed texture or appearance. So clearly to me, that means that this is a fuzz test. It's a really cute fuzz test. Um, OK, so these are all adorable. Unfortunately, it's not quite the kind of fuzzy that I'm looking for. So OK, not this definition. What about definition number two? Something that's difficult to perceive clearly or understand and explain precisely, indistinct or vague. I think this word indistinct is the one we should be caring about here. If your testing is indistinct, it isn't sharply defined. And that's the main difference between other types of testing and fuzz testing. When you write a unit test, you give your system a carefully crafted input, and then you check its output. The expectations are sharply defined, and they're typically going to be deterministic. However, with fuzz testing, it's working around the edges that your system is already testing, blurring those precise lines around your system that you already know about. It's exploring code paths that are typically going to be atypical and unexpected, which may turn up equally unexpected results. Fuzzing isn't going to replace your unit tests, but it can find some neat bugs that your unit tests may miss. So before we jump into some code, let's take a moment to discuss the main stages of fuzzing as it runs. The first thing that's going to happen is you'll provide some starting values to the fuzzer. This is going to be especially helpful if you're trying to fuzz something that's a little bit specific. For example, you're doing a parser or something like that. Um, if you're trying to parse images or HTML or JSON, then providing these inputs is going to be really helpful to the fuzzer. Fortunately, you should hopefully be able to leverage some of the inputs that you're already using to your unit tests. So you really shouldn't have to write too many new ones here. This is optional fuzzing with Go, but it does make fuzzing more effective faster. Next, fuzzing is going to start. A fuzzing engine will look at the starting values, it'll perform mutations, and it'll start testing your code. The Go fuzzer can run upwards of hundreds of thousands per second, so it can do a lot really quickly. And this is where the magic is going to happen. And finally, if it finds a bug, it's going to tell you, which is important. That's what you're looking for. All right, so let's jump into a bit of the code to learn how you can write one yourself. First thing we're going to do is we're going to define our fuzz test. That's what you're seeing here. This is the overarching function of the test, much like a unit test or a benchmark. And these can live right next to those tests in that underscore test.go file that you have. In much the same way that a unit test accepts a, te a testing.t and a benchmark accepts a testing.b, a fuzz test accepts a testing.f. And this testing.f is new for Go 118, and it provides the functions that you need for your fuzz test. It works much the same as a testing.t with a few additions. Those are f.add and f.fuzz. f.add is going to be what you'll use to provide those starting inputs I was talking about. And the function that's provided to f.fuzz is what's actually going to be run when fuzzing is executed. So first thing we're going to do in this fuzz foo example is to provide some starting values by calling f.add. These starting values are going to be kept in something called a seed corpus, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Every call to f.add is going to correspond to an entry in your fuzz in your seed corpus. So you can call this function as many times as you want to make as big of a seed corpus as you want, and I'll show that a bit in my demo. And you can also do any preparation for your fuzz test here, much like you would do with, for example, a table-driven test in a unit test, maybe before you do that loop with your t.run, all that work that you do beforehand, you do that here too. And finally, you define the fuzz target using f.fuzz. f.fuzz is going to take a function whose first parameter is a testing.t, and the remaining parameters are your fuzzing arguments, which inform what kinds of data the fuzzing engine is going to be generating and providing to your fuzz target. 
And this fuzz target, it's what's going to be called over and over again as fuzzing executes. And that's it. It's actually pretty simple to write a really effective fuzz test in just a few lines of code. So a term that you are going to hear often in the context of fuzzing is the corpus. So let's just take a moment to explore this term, make sure you understand it before we jump into the demo. The corpus is a collection of inputs that guide fuzzing. For the GoFuzzer, a corpus is made up of two components, the seed corpus and the generated corpus. The seed corpus is a user-provided data set which can be used to guide the fuzzing engine. It's sourced from two places, f.add calls within the fuzz test and the files in the test data fuzz directory within the package that's named after your fuzz test. I'll show that in my demo too. The seed corpus also serves an additional purpose in Go, running with Go test even when fuzzing isn't running. So that can act as a unit test or a regression test. And I'll demonstrate that too. The generated corpus, on the other hand, rather than being user defined, it's machine generated. And it's all fully maintained by the fuzzing engine. It's stored in a fuzz directory within your Go cache. And this data is only going to be used while fuzzing. It's helpful for the fuzzing engine to be using over time, pick up where it left off, learn as it goes. But you really shouldn't have to look at it Knowing that it's there is helpful, but you shouldn't have to go in and mess with it in any way. It's just helpful for the fuzzing engine to work effectively. So here's a small example to illustrate how the fuzzing engine uses these two elements of the corpus. The first thing it's going to do is gather all of the entries from both the seed corpus and the generated corpus. And then it's going to feed each of those inputs into your fuzz test to make sure there are no crashes. And the fuzzing engine will then start mutating all of these entries in the corpus and feeding them to the fuzz test. If it finds something interesting, it's going to add that to the generated corpus, and it's going to keep fuzzing. If it finds a crash, say a panic, maybe your test fails with a t dot error, something like that, it's going to add that to the seed corpus. So let's take a break here, move into the fun part, and let's do a demo and see it in action. Great. All right. So. I have this index any function. This is within the strings package of the standard library. Basically, all it's doing, I'll show it with an example. It's a little bit easier to understand it that way. There are two input strings that you give it, and it gives an integer back. If you give something like ABC and XYZ, X, Y, and Z don't show up in this, so it will return negative 1. But if you give it X, C, Z, this C character appears in this index here, the last index of ABC, so it will return 2. So if I look at this code, I don't really know what's happening at first glance. There's a lot of special cases. It's kind of long. It's doing some special ASCII set stuff. I, I don't know what it's doing. So I'm just going to write my own version that I think is going to be simpler. So this is my absolute bare bones index any function. Just looping over, checking that it's there. So I took this test from the standard library. These are some of the unit tests that it has for their code. And I'm just popping it into a table-driven test. So running t.run, I'm giving those inputs to my index any and making sure that the output is what I expect. So let me run it with go test. If all is good, it'll pass, and it does. OK, so I have somewhere like 13 unit tests. That's a lot. So I could just say, all right, I'm done. I've done my testing. It's, there's a lot there. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to use it. I'm going to move on with my day. I could do that. I'm going to go one step further, and I'm going to show what unit tests might have missed. And I'm going to write a fuzz test. So let's do that together. So the first thing we're going to do is define our fuzz test. So we'll just call that fuzz index any. You can call it whatever you want, as long as it has that fuzz prefix. And it takes a testing.f. So I'm going to give it some seed corpus values. So I have these here that I just copied just for my own ease of use during the demo. But you can use whatever you want here. So this is just coming from the unit test. So I have a bunch of tests here that are just two input strings. And I'm going to loop over them and put them into my C corpus. So range over the tests, f dot add, and there they are. So pretty simple. So this is just going to put all of these here into my C corpus. All right, so now I get to decide what I actually want to fuzz. So let's first define our fuzz target by calling f dot fuzz which takes a function whose first parameter is that testing.t. 
And then I just fi figure out now what are my fuzzy arguments. So what do I want it to be generating? I want it to be generating two strings because that's what I need for my test. So I can name these whatever I want. I'll just do this for consistency. I now have two strings being generated. Okay. So now it's where, where is the, the decision that I get to make here comes in. What do I actually want to be fuzzing in my test? In the simplest way, I could just do this. For your code, that might be enough. That's only going to be checking for panics, but if that's what you're looking for, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with writing a fuzz test like this. I could write it very simply, and it would report issues if there's a panic. I'm not super concerned about panics here, so I want to do a little bit more. So I have an advantage here where I have an implementation that I know works. I have this index any function that's coming from the standard library. So if I have something that works, I can apply something called differential fuzzing. It's a kind of a big term, but it's not actually that complicated. I'm basically just fuzzing the difference between two functions. So for example, if you're refactoring your code, you can use this to test the versions, or you know, maybe you've made some performance changes, things like that. So what I'm actually going to do instead is I'm going to make sure that the two outputs of those functions given the same inputs are the same. So I'll do a got and a want. I got this from my function. And then I want this. So those should be the same. If they're not the same, then I have a bug. So let's print something useful here. So I'll just do a little message here, something like this, that will tell me my index any returns this and these strings, index any returns this. Okay, so s, this one, got and want. Okay, cool, and that's it. So I have a pretty simple fuzz test. It should be making sure that they're the same. So let's run a go test again. See what's going on. Go test. Everything's passing. Great. I'm also going to do go test dash v, just so you can see a bit under the hood here. So you can actually see, as I was saying before, that these seed corpuses are run every time. So you can see that it's running all of my unit tests up here. And then you can see it's running those same seed corpus values here. So seed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 12. All right, so let's do the fun part. Let's actually apply fuzzing. So I use the same go test tool as before. In the same way that I match with go test dash run, I'll do go test dash fuzz instead, and I will give it my fuzz test. And it found a bug very, very, very quickly in 0.121 seconds. So that's a lot faster than I could have done by staring at my code. So let's just look for a moment, see what's happening. So it says it gathered some baseline coverage. It ran my seed corpus. All that means is it ran those seed corpuses first, the seed corpus entries first to make sure there wasn't an issue. And then it started fuzzing with all the workers I could possibly do on my machine. This here is a really interesting line. It says it's minimizing a 60 byte failing input file. So that means it found a failure that's 60 bytes long and then it tried to make it as small as possible so that I could debug it easier finished minimizing, and then this is the error message. So it's saying that with these inputs, my index any is giving negative one, but the strings index any is giving zero. Okay, that's a little strange. It told me it wrote it to this test data file, and if I want to rerun it, I can run it with this command here. So let's go check out this file and see what's going on. So this is a special file format just for the C corpus and any kind of corpus files. It's not that important that you know what it's doing, but just know that these are the two inputs. So my index any is giving negative one, the strings index any is giving a value. So that's a little bit weird. I'm gonna give you a moment to look at this code. Don't shout it out. See if you might figure out in this code what's going on. What might be causing that to be doing something different from the strings index any function? You think you know? Maybe, all right. I'm going to spoil it for you. So let's ease into a little bit of debugging here. I'm actually going to run this go test again. Oops, if I can get all of it. There we go. And I can see that this failure is still happening here. So that's reproducing just that one failure. Let's do just a little bit of debugging here. So when I'm ranging over this S, what this C actually is, is a rune. It's not a byte, it's a rune. And this here is where my problem lies. So I can actually show this a bit. 
with a debug line. So I'm going to do the rune UTF-8. Let's do the decode the rune and the string. Let's check it out. I'll do the same thing here. I'll do it for the second one, too. Because I want to know what's actually passing to that function. I want to see what's going on. So let's go ahead and just do a print statement, debug it a little bit. I've got the S rune, so I'll make that equal to this. This one is equal to this. And then I want to know if they're the same, because it seems like they're the same based on that test. OK, so let's just print those in there. Great. So let's do another go test. OK, so what's happening here? I'm actually going to do another new line here just to make it a little easier to see it. Great. So it's saying that these are both this weird rune here. This is actually the error rune. And what's happening is that both of these, when you actually look at the rune of this string value, it's actually the error rune. And technically, if I go back to the docs for this string's code, it says it's returning the index of the first instance of any Unicode code point from cars in S. So Unicode code point being rune. So these are actually both the same rune, even if they look different to our eyes. Whereas what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the bytes. So things are going to happen in really strange ways that aren't what I want. So the fix is actually a one-line fix, which often bugs are. And if I do this instead, my problem should go away. So we'll run go test with that again. It's passing. And I have a bug fix. So once again, I just want to show that these C corpus values are still running. And there's this new one here. This file that's in this new test data fuzz, fuzz index any directory here, this is part of the C corpus now. So this is now a free regression test. You check this in, you check in your bug fix, you check in your fuzz test. When you run go test, it will show that it's a regression if you change that code again. So let's just one more time, just for kicks, let's do dash fuzz, make sure I don't have any more bugs in my code. And I'm good. So now it's saying 19 instead. What's that saying? It's basically that means I have something in my generated corpus now. The fuzzing engine added some before. Now it's just picking up where it left off, making sure there's no problems. And it's going. You can see it's running really quickly here. It's running upwards of 500,000 inputs a second. So it's doing a lot on my machine right now. My machine's working very hard to try to find bugs. And now it's up to you. You can run this as long as you want to. You can stop this whenever you want to. There are tools out there like OSS Fuzz, which can run this continuously, which is really great, and it can report issues to you. We have had bugs in the standard library reported to us from uh, OSS Fuzz with Fuzz tooling, uh, vulnerabilities even. So it's really effective. And I'm going to stop this whenever I decide to. So I'm going to go ahead and just stop it here. Just Control C, Command C. It stopped. It says it passes. And I'm good. And that's our demo. So I'm not done quite yet. I want to show you a little bit of the magic. Now that you've seen fuzzing working and you're like, how is it doing this? I want to just take a moment to dive under the hood and just see a little bit about what's actually happening. What is that fuzzing engine doing? So I'll spend just a few minutes there. So as we've discussed, the fuzzing engine is responsible for generating these inputs being tested. And it has to be really careful with doing this. It can't just do it however it wants to. Getting this right is going to be essential in making sure that it's finding bugs and having an effective fuzzing system. So one approach a fuzzing engine could take for generating these inputs would just be complete randomization. The infinite monkey theorem is the theory that a monkey hitting keys on a keyboard at random would eventually enter the entire works of Shakespeare if given enough time to do so, and enough time being infinity. Well, we don't have infinity to find our bugs. We want to find bugs a little bit faster than that. So let's just do a little bit better. So let's dive into three issues with a naive fuzzer. It's going to be generating completely unrelated inputs. It's going to be ignoring the outcome of previous runs. And it's structure agnostic. It's not paying attention to what kind of data is useful for it to be generating. So let's start with unrelated inputs. Why is this a problem? 
if the fuzzing engine is generating completely random inputs, you may end up with a sequence of bytes that have no discernible pattern, no discernible properties. And it might look something like that. Though this might find bugs in some systems, it's not gonna be very effective for most of them. Let's say you're actually fuzzing an HTML parser. If you provide this single input that looks something like this to the fuzzing engine, it's got an HTML tag with some text in it. If it starts mutating that input instead of just generating random ones with some level of randomness applied to the mutations, it's gonna end up producing values that are gonna look something like this. It's actually a lot more useful to your fuzz test. It's more likely to be finding bugs and stressing your system in interesting ways. Okay, another reason this is gonna be ineffective is because it ignores the outcome of the inputs it's been testing. Let's go back to our previous example of, of inputs here. If you're testing that HTML parser, there's a good chance that this input here, this anchor, is gonna be pretty interesting to you that it generated. You provided an HTML tag as the initial input, but it generated an anchor tag. This is pretty likely to hit a new code path that your previous test cases missed, and it should pay attention to that. It should know that it did that. It should save this input to the generated corpus and not just apply random mutations to that initial input you provided, but it should also be making mutations on this one, learning as it goes and trying to expand the testing surface even further. You can almost imagine your code as a tree with different branches going into different parts of your system and the different outputs in the form of leaves. The fuzzing engine's goal should be trying to reach as many of these leaves as possible or as many unique paths through your code as possible with coverage as the goal. And last but not least, Let's talk about the structure of the inputs being tested and why the fuzzing engine should care about this. So it's structure agnostic. That's not great. Let's say you have a function foo, which takes an int, a byte, and a string, and you want to fuzz this. If the fuzzing engine is only generating raw bytes, you could theoretically break the byte slice apart and feed those values into your function. But this is kind of an eyesore. It's going to waste a lot of time, and it's also like kind of error prone too. It's also going to be generating inputs that are never actually going to be useful to you a lot of the time. One of these two returns is likely to get hit fairly often, and that's going to waste our computing time. We don't want to waste time. We want to find bugs as fast as possible. The fuzzing engine doesn't realize it's supposed to be generating integers, nor does it realize how much, gen much inputs to generate, how much data to generate. So if the fuzzing engine can know the structure of your function from the beginning, it can be a lot smarter about what it's doing, a lot smarter about what it's giving you to test with. Plus, code like this is a lot easier to understand and write. So there are several issues with a naive fuzzer that's going to be just generating inputs at random. Let's make Go's fuzzing engine as well as it can be working as effective as possible. Go's fuzzing engine is mutation-based. So rather than generating random inputs from scratch, it's going to be mutating existing inputs that it finds or that you give it in interesting ways. It's coverage guided. So it's actually paying attention to which parts of the system are being hit as it goes, learning as it runs, becoming smarter and smarter, and attempting to expand the code coverage as it runs. And finally, it's structure aware, using the format of the inputs to our advantage. So the fuzzing engine avoids running through inputs that will never be valid or interesting to us while we test. Go's fuzzing engine is fast and it's effective at finding bugs. And it should be just as easy to write as a unit test. Thank you so much for listening. I'm thrilled to see how the Go community is going to be using fuzzing in new interesting ways. I hope you'll find me during this conference and chat with me about fuzzing. And I'll be on the GopherCon Discord. And thank you so much for being here.